Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord. I'm a psychiatrist based in London. And I'm in conversation today with Mary, who is the mother and carer of a young man with schizophrenia. Mary, let's go right back to the beginning. Um, what was the first thing that you noticed that things were not quite right for your son? I think from the very beginning, um, I have to say a bit about the background. Um, Due to my husband's work, we lived abroad for some years and the first time we went abroad was when my son was starting primary school and due to the circumstances as the job was married accompanied, my son stayed behind at a small private prep school which we assumed was the best in circumstances the best place for him to go for continuity in his education. Unfortunately, because he was very young, he was barely eight, um, unbeknown to us, various um, circumstances, various things happened to him, which he wasn't able to tell me about because he was too frightened at the time and too confused by it. This led to um, his early um, teens as being quite unsettled and difficult. However, he was an outgoing um, young man. He, he was good at sport. He was physically a later developer compared to his peers, which always concerned me slightly because he physically didn't mature in, at the same um, speed, same pace. He was also um, quite competitive. He was very musical. He um, took all the. He went on to um, public school, to senior school again as a boarding, and that was when he told me about what had happened to him at his prep school, and I believed him, and I still believe him, which I think was the trigger in his late teens and puberty, um, partly the cause of his m mental breakdown, which unfortunately wasn't diagnosed for several years. Initially he, um, at the age of 18, because there was nothing we could do to stop him, and my husband was again abroad, but on um, this time unaccompanied, and I was still in, in this country um, with my son's younger daughter, a young sister, my daughter. and. My son decided, having sadly failed, having taken a number of AS and A2 exams, went to pieces, didn't achieve uh, university entrance grades, although he was all set to go, and things went from bad to worse. He, his excuse for, for getting away was to, his father was in Central Africa, um, he wasn't in communication with us very often, and my son announced to me that he was going to go and find his father <laughs> without a great deal of money and planning to take an overland, um, go there o overland, which was considerably was, was impossible because it was incredibly dangerous. However, he got as far as East Africa, which is where we had lived for a short time and I'd been born and brought up. So he ended up with friends and relations who looked after him. But from that point onwards, he was never the same. And eventually, having gained a place to go, he decided he didn't want to stay in this country when he returned from his first trip abroad. He wanted to um, go back to Africa. And he gained a place at Cape Peninsula University in Cape Town to study um, tourism management, got himself out there, and I was due to, we were due to visit him uh, the first year he was there, because the academic year starts in January until the following January, and we went out for Christmas after his first year to find that he, unbeknown to us, he dropped out of university and had been living fairly in, in circumstances which were not good, and we I brought him back to this country and from then on despite the fact that he was behaving extremely um, unreasonably 
he was paranoid, he wouldn't go out, he would never leave the house, he didn't want anything to do with his friends, he would hide under the dining room table for no apparent reason, he wouldn't go into a room unless the curtains were, unless they were closed, and there were various other fairly dr dramatic effects of the illness. What were those dramatic effects? His inability to communicate, his hyper-sensibility to, to everything. He was, as I say, paranoid. He was also not aggressive, but incredibly un nervous and, and unsettled. And, as I say, would not talk to anyone. If anyone came to the front door of the house, where he wouldn't leave the house, he wouldn't leave his room if he wasn't... Um, if he, he was in bed for the better part of the day. And whatever I suggested, whatever I tried to do, he, he just couldn't um, achieve this. And eventually I got in touch with, in despair, I tried, I went to the four members of our general practitioner, um, practitioners, I got absolutely no help from them whatsoever. I eventually, because it was very new to the area, um, tracked down the early intervention psychosis team and they did come and visit him in the house because he wouldn't leave the house. And basically, that my son became a different person. He lost all his um, confidence, his ability to concentrate. If we did go out on a number of occasions, he'd, we'd get halfway down the road and he'd scream to return, he wanted to go home and he'd grab the steering wheel and forced me to stop and take him back home. So it was just a complete and utter um, breakdown. Unfortunately, as I say, the early intervention psychosis team did put him on course of medication, which wasn't monitored correctly, in my opinion, because he developed the most appalling side effects. Um, and eventually, understandably, he said, I don't want to take them anymore. And by this time, my husband had returned from abroad and would not tolerate our son under the same roof, which led to my husband evicting him and also um, making him go as voluntarily to, into a psychiatric hospital for the... I can't remember which section it is, for the, for the 27 days, 28 days assessment. Needless to say, they didn't give him any treatment, they didn't put him on med medication. They said that there was nothing wrong with him, effectively. Um, and when he and when he couldn't return to the house because my husband had evicted him, um, he ended up living in the most appalling state in a flat um, about a two quarters an hour's drive from where the family home is. And when eventually he had a crisis, luckily I was with him, it was in a public place. The police were called, and for his own safety, he was taken into custody. And eventually, um, <laughs> um, taken into a psychiatric hospital, which took from two o'clock in the afternoon when the crisis happened to midnight when the on-call psychiatrist rang me at home to say, ask me what was wrong with my son, despite the fact that he'd already been under the care of the um, early intervention psychosis team and after Parkland, after his stay in hospital, local psychiatric hospital for assessment, he was supposedly under the care of the um, local mental health team, which all failed to achieve what I felt they should achieve despite the fact that I, ke I kept on telling everyone that I, my son was not well. However, having been in hospital for on that first occasion for, I think in the end it was nearly six months, despite the fact that he didn't want to be there, and compared to the majority of other patients, he shouldn't have been there, but there was nowhere else for him to go. And eventually he was discharged into the home treatment team care, and I found him another flat, which was slightly better than the original one, and he basically went downhill again, although he was 
on medication, the um, support team was supposed to go and see him and they were supposed to monitor, make sure he was taking his medication. Unfortunately, he was, became too ill again and this time attempted suicide. First, first time was on, he overdosed on antipsychotic drugs, which he'd been given unbeknown to me by the mental health um, center psychiatrist because I'd asked him to see my son again, um, although I wasn't present at the meeting. Um, I didn't appreciate the fact that he'd, he had prescribed four weeks worth of yet another very strong antipsychotic drug on top of what he was already supposed to be taking, which my son had stockpiled, not intentionally, but just because um, he couldn't remember to take it or he wouldn't take it. And I instinctively, because I wanted to know what had happened at the meeting with the psychiatrist, I rang him up, got no reply, went to the flat, alerted the um, home treatment team first, went to the flat myself to find that they'd already broken in and found him comatose from an overdose. He was stabilised in hospital but wasn't admitted to the psychiatric wing. He was sent home to his flat under the care of the home treatment team and he then slipped his wrists. Um, but he did ring me when he did this. He did ring me and say, I've had a nosebleed. Um, I think I'm just going to hospital. And um, by the time he, by the time the treatment team had found him and taken him in to general hospital to the um, accident emergency, um, he'd been cleaned up. And that was when they readmitted him to the psychiatric ward for yet another only four months, just over that. But this time, I'm afraid I took it upon myself to make sure that the care package and his treatment when he was discharged was better. And thanks to um, the mental health centre and the care coordinator, who I have a lot to thank for, um, she, he is now in... Um, Supported accommodation. It's one. It's the, the Together charity, which has saved my son's life and mine. I have to say, um, and he is now in supported accommodation in in his own um, flat apartment with others in the same block suffering from mental ill health. But he is much more stable, and he's now able to drive. He's more communicative, and although he's still not, as far as in my view, capable of, of working, he has found himself a voluntary job once a week, and he goes out and he plays sport occasionally, not very often. But, again, because it's very difficult with someone with this sort of illness to persuade them to um, look after themselves, physically... He does, but, uh, well, not physically, um, no, it, it, how can I put it, um, he, he keeps himself clean, he, he, he looks after his, his, himself, but he doesn't eat properly and has developed, you know, this overweight, severely overweight, and spends an awful lot of time just sitting in his flat, which I'm now, uh, he also goes through phases when I, when I know he's not very well, when he won't allow me to come into the flat. However, because there is someone within the block who does go in occasionally to say, clean up or make sure you've washed your clothes and so forth, which he does anyway, um, I don't, that pressure's been taken off me. What would you say are the take home lessons from your experiences? My experience is the fact that God help any poor young person who doesn't have a member of the family or a member of the mental health team to fight their corner because if I hadn't written letters and banged the table my son would never have ended up where he is now and I, as far as I'm concerned I don't think he'd be with us anyway because if I hadn't gone to the flat that day I'm afraid he'd know that he wouldn't be alive now so um, I feel that um, 
the care package and the care pathways rather should be geared to the individual and not just taken on the face value, the fact that he had me there to support him um, and the fact that he came from a good background, for want of a better expression, because it doesn't matter who you are or what sort of background you come from, if you have mental ill health problems, uh, you need the support from the system. So it sounds like you had to campaign and, and fight his corner a lot, and left to his own devices, he would have been unable to do that, partly because of the illness. Absolutely, and also the fact that because of the illness, and I believe, again, the other aspect of it is the practical um, part we play as carers. I do understand and appreciate medical incompetence. I would never dream of interfering with anything that the professionals um, do, but I do feel as a carer, and the example is the medication he's given by the psychiatrist, unbeknown to me, is that we, we as carers should be given the practical information on because if, so, if, the, if, if an individual is, is physically ill rather than mentally ill, the carer is told what medication they're taking, when to give it to them. Um, and this is something that, again, despite the fact that my son signed letters to say that he wants me involved, um, this has never been the case. But it sounds like what, one of the things you're, you seem to be saying is that your, your need to campaign and fight your son's corner is about the fact you're having to compensate or make up for deficiencies in the system. So what are those deficiencies? Um, the care package. The I do appreciate, again, it's the shortage of personnel, um, financial, the yeah, financial aspect, but the um, care coordinators and the support workers, one, they have to, they have to be able to um, relate to the, ind the individual sufferer because if they don't they're not going to achieve anything and they, I think they just have to be if we'd had uh, a better backup I don't think my son would have ended up in the hospital on the second occasion when he attempted suicide but, uh, but at risk of um, sounding um, a bit harsh about the system yes. uh, to be I brutally don't... frank it sounds to me like the system doesn't understand the nature of mental illness because your son basically had a serious mental illness there was nothing peculiarly different about the nature of the serious mental illness he had he just had mm. a, 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 a serious mental illness and the system um, failed him on many occasions but failed him because it didn't seem to understand the nature of mental illness in terms well, of how you how you you help people with a serious mental illness I, I'm afraid I do agree with you although I've heard of other people who haven't had such severe um, episodes getting far more support and treatment um, in their home by their general practitioner Sergi um, and yes I'm I don't like to say it but yes I agree um, however when eventually they had to take notice because I made them on my son's behalf. Then, yes, it, they had, considering how ill he has been over the last se nearly seven years, um, he is actually reasonably stable and, and the support is there. But it's from the charity as much as the mental health team. What was your most frightening experience in, in this terrible journey you've been on? I think it was just seeing him become so ill that he wasn't the same person and I couldn't get through to him and there was at one stage with through frustration and the illness he was never aggressive towards me but I could see him harming himself which obviously he did attempt to do but pr prior to that if he <laughs> I mean, he, he smashed his fist into a into a, the picture glass on one occasion, but came and told me, and he was remorseful and upset. Um, but I could see that this could lead to far more serious episodes. What was your lowest moment? When he was taken into hospital. That finished me. I found it so 
hard to see him there, obviously sedated for his own safety. But walking through the ah, uh, I can I can cope with it now, but at the time, and the fact that there's been two occasions when he's ended up in a secure psychiatric hospital, just seeing some where well, he wasn't my son, and. I wanted him back. And to be fair, now, and then a past month, well, since before Christmas, um, they're having glimmers of my of who he is, or who he would have been. <laughs> there may be a mother listening to this who has a son or a daughter um, who has the same symptoms yes. that your, your son or daughter, your, your son has had. Yes. Um, what would you say to them? What's the important, most important thing from your experience do you, that, that you think they should know? I think they have to try and find, either through the services or even the internet, um, where to go for help. And also, um, hopefully get the support of the family, if they have support. Because my daughter, his younger sister, has suffered almost as much as I have because she has seen her beloved brother, who they, who got on, they got on very well always, just turn into someone that she didn't recognise and couldn't cope with. So that's an, also sub siblings need support as well as the parent. I just want to go back to that incident you mentioned that he had a, a, an emergency in a public place and that led to the initial admission to hospital under a section of the Mental Health Act, I think, the police yes, were called. Exactly. What, what was that emergency in the public place? What actually happened? Well, he, he, had, he was on the street um, near his flat, just running around and laughing and running into the road and refusing to get into the car when I came to get him. Um, and just having a psychotic e episode. He wasn't aggressive, he wasn't um, harming anyone, but potentially he was going to end up under a car or... Um, and what were you doing at this moment? Well, I was standing by the car trying to persuade him to get into the car. But without success? Without success. So and what was that like for you? It was heartbreaking. It was... Horrific, and it was only because a member of the public had obviously witnessed this, who then involved the police. And thank God I was there because I could say to them, "My son has psychiatric problems. Please, you know, he's not going to harm anyone. Um, they just make sure he's safe." And they, they, I don't know exactly what happened when he got to the police station, um, and it took a long time from. The, the episode on the street to um, being told what had happened and where he was. So I assume he was in custody for some some hours, which again I think would not have been particularly helpful. But so it sounds like it was almost like twelve hours before he ended up in, in a, a secure place where he was meant to get treatment. Then you get a phone call from someone where it looks like the system again doesn't really. They hadn't communicated what's happened at, at all. all. So However, that must have been very disheartening. Oh, it was, it was. It was just. I couldn't believe it. Um, and also the fact that when he'd been taken into custody by the police, I rang the care coordinator who should have been looking after him to explain this to her, and she basically washed her hands of him because she. I told her he'd been taken away by the police. And the following day, um, I was obviously speaking to everyone and anyone and everyone to find out what was happening after I'd spoken to the psychiatrist, the on-call psychiatrist. I got a phone call from this woman. Didn't quite put the phone down on her. I just said she could find out through her official channels because she was the one who should have been in touch with the, the psychiatrist at the hospital. So you feel that you've been failed by a lot of people in mental health services? I, I have, I do, but um, despite the fact that I put in an official complaint, the report that eventually was written wasn't worth the paper it was written on because they were all covering their backs and just not communicating or, 
or um, making, making any sense. Mary, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.